morning. We're in Sefer Yeshaya, Perik Yudalit. It's Yeshaya Hanabi's prophecy of the fall, the defeat of Bovel. Of course, uh, this, these are all prophecies. These things haven't happened yet. He's not describing an event. He's prophesizing about an event. We're going to continue Perik Yudalit. We'll read Perik Tesvav, which also discusses the fall of Bovel and discusses as well um, the fall, actually Perak Tezvah discusses the fall of Moab. As we said, we'd read these prakim and translate them and highlight certain sukim um, as necessary. So we are in Yeshaya Perak Yudalit, and it's Pasuk Chaf Beis. Yeshaya continues in the name of the Rabbonu Shlom, and says, Vakamti Alehem Noom Hashem Tsevokois, I will rise up against the nation of Babel, so says the Rabbon Shalom. Behikrati la Babel Shem Usha'ar Nin Venin Veneche Noom Hashem. And I will wipe out from Babel four things a Shem, a Sha'ar, a nin and a nechet. We text page, I just read from page 118 in the art scroll, page 119, the translation, I will rise up against them, the word of Hashem, master of legions, and I will cut off for Babylonia a name, a remnant, a child, and grandchild. This is the word of Hashem. So there are four things that the Rebbe Shalom tells Yeshaya, and Yeshaya prophesies will happen to Babel. The Rebbe Shalom will cut off a name, a remnant, a child, and a grandchild. The Gemara in Megillah and Afyud Amit Beis comments on this pasuk: "V'kamti aleim v'hichrati l'Babel Shem u'she'er v'nin v'nechad no Mashem Shem." When the Pasuk says that I will cut off from Bavel a name, the Gemara says, Shem Zehaksav. It's the, it's the writing, the script. Bavel had their own script. We understand that there's the ABCs, there's Chinese script. There are different lettering systems in the world. And apparently Bavel at one time had its own lettering system. And the Rabbanu Shalom says that, um, that with the downfall of Bavel, literally anything that's a reminder of Bavel will go by the wayside. Their special script will be cut down. Shem Zehaksa. Sha'ar Zeloshin. I will cut from Bavel Sha'ar. And the English that we just read says a remnant. The Gemara says the remnant Zeloshin. It means the Babylonian language. Now, when we talk about the Babylonian language, we always assume that the language in Babylon was Aramaic. The Talmud Bavli is in Aramaic, and we're still learning Talmud Bavli in Aramaic. So what does the Gemara mean that no longer is there the Babylonian language? We'll take a look at that in a moment. Nin Zemalchus, the third thing the Pasuk says is, I will take away a Nin, the Gemara says they're Malchus. They will be left with no form of kingdom whatsoever. They'll be completely cut off from the from the concept of being a sovereign nation or a sovereign ruler. Neched zuvashti. A neched, a great, a great, a great grandchild. A grandchild means vashti. Vashti is a descendant of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And she's the last descendant of Nebuchadnezzar. With her execution in the first parak of Megillus Esther, that ends the descendants of Nebuchadnezzar. So this is what the, the Gemara says the Pasuk means. I will cut off from Bavel the, their special script, their special language, their sovereignty, and any remnant of children, meaning Vash. Tosvis in Megillah Daf Yudamid Beis asks, She'er zeh loshen, I will cut off from Bavel their language, 
kasha taisus es. This is difficult. Shadain he mesaper beloshin aramis. People are still talking Aramaic. We ourselves, Jewish people, still are engaged in learning Talmud Bavli, and Talmud Bavli is written in Aramaic. When we do Shnaya Mikra Vecha Targum, we, we use the Targum uh, Unkelis. Targum Unkelis is in Aramaic. We're still using what appears to be the language of the Babylonians. Tosus answers, the Nira the Rot Saloma Lashin Shaham Lochem Mishtam Shimbo Shein Shar Ha'am Makirimbo. Tosus says something that we find in other places in Shas that the the govern, the, uh, the king and his inner ministers, they had developed their own language, not just in Bavel, in other countries. It was a language, sort of, when I think about this, my parents, Zechronim Lebracha, spoke numerous languages, having come from Europe. My father, in particular, understood multiple languages. And when they wanted to discuss something in the house that uh, wasn't the business of their children, sometimes, sometimes they would switch to Polish, other languages, and they would talk so that no one else would understand. So Tosos is telling us that the king, the queen, the inner circle of government had their own language so that when they wanted to discuss issues of government, they would know, we can understand this today, there wouldn't be leaks. Everything that the government discusses wouldn't be on the front page of a newspaper, or everything that the government discusses wouldn't be the subject of some commentary because everybody knows what Netanyahu said at a closed door meeting, so there's no leaks. The only people that understand what is being discussed at an important meeting are people that the king trusts not to leak, and nobody else that's in the meeting would even understand what they're talking about because they develop their own special language for the for Inyane Malchus. So Tosva says when the Gemara is talking about cutting off the language of Bavel, that it no longer exists, it means this royal language of Bavel that no longer exists. So there's no remnant of Babylonian uh, kingship, Babylonian sovereignty. The common folk language, Aramaic, remains, and it remains until today. That's what Tosfus says. In another place, Tosfus asks about the Ksav. Tosfus asks about the script. He says that there is still known script of the Babylonians, and therefore, why does the Gemara say that the script has been cut off if they're in the time of Tosfus, it was still extant? So we have two questions. Why does the Gemara say that the language of Bava was cut off and the script of Bava was cut off? Here in Megillah, Tosfus asks, they're still Aramaic. In another place, Tosfus asks, there still appears to be the script. Tosfus answers in both places. Uh, gives Terutzim here in Megillah, Tosas answers the question about the language. What was cut off was the king, the royal language. The Maral here says a very interesting thing that's important for how we perceive, quote unquote, our rights as we live. And the Maral is explained by Rav Kutner and Apachad Yitzhak as follows. The Babylonian, Tosas has a question. How can the Pasuk in Yeshaya prophesize that when Bavel falls, they will not be left with a language? Their language will be cut off. But we have Aramaic. And then Tosfus answers that there is a Lashin Malucha. But the Maral says an interesting fact, an interesting idea. It says that when a kingdom falls, it's possible that there are still remnants of the kingdom, a certain culture that's still left behind of the kingdom, a language, a script. But with the fall of the kingdom, to the extent that there's still a language or a script, it's, as we would say in Yiddish, Maled Ois Aber Tansen. Used to be, a, there's a saying in Yiddish, uh, you can teach a bear how to dance. Remember the days of the circus, 
if you went to the circus, there would be a dancing bear. And in Yiddish, they used to say you can teach anyone anything and you wouldn't even understand what you taught him. It's being done by rote. A bear doesn't understand what he's doing. He doesn't understand that he's dancing. He wants to get something to eat. So he picks up his leg, he picks up his arm, he twists his head. It looks like he's dancing. He has no idea what he's doing, but it's sort of Pavlovian. If you train him to do this for some food, he'll do it. And then you train him to take the second move and he'll do it. Before you know it, it looks like a bear is dancing. We can Iceland not bear tons. But he's not he's not really doing anything. He's just doing something by rote. So the morale explains that so long as a nation exists and it's sovereign and as a king and as a government is functioning, the the niceties of Malchus, a special language, a special script, all have importance. But when a malucha falls, the kingdom falls, there's no government, it's been overrun, been overtaken, but people continue to speak that language or continue using that script, it is no longer a malchus script and it is no longer a malchus language. At this point, People are only doing things by rote, but no longer malchus. So what the morale is telling us is that a person could be doing the same thing that was done by a king, but if the king did it, there's a royalty to it. If the king's no longer around and people are stu still doing it, commoners are still doing it, that doesn't make them kings. It just means that they're copying something by rote. In other words, if you're just doing something that someone else does, but you're really not at that level, then what you're doing doesn't turn you into a king. Talking the language of a king doesn't make you a king. Using the script of a king doesn't make you a king. So the morale says, yes, Tosos is right. It could be that the language of Bovel still remains and the script of Bovel still remains, but it's even an embarrassment that the script and the language still remains because to the extent that the language remains, the script remains, but the people don't conduct themselves as if there were prestige to Bovell, they are now downgrading the language and downgrading the script. It doesn't prove that they're king. So copying things that a king does, copying the way that a king speaks, copying the way that a king writes without any, any, um, without coordinating that with conduct becoming of a king, doesn't make you a king. So therefore the Nevoah is, I will cut off from Bovel the language and the script. And if you want to keep on talking the language and writing the script, that's fine, but it's no longer a sign of any royalty. In fact, it could be a sign of a degradation of the royalty. So as we continue to do things, and this is very important for us as Klal Yisrael, <clears throat> we can't and we shouldn't do mitzvahs v'malert oisaber tansen. The fact that my father did it this way I do it this way. But why did your father do it this way? And why do we do a mitzvah this way? I have no idea. I'm just copying everybody. You can't copy. To give something significance and importance means that you're going to understand why you're doing it and the reason it's being done in a particular way. And that gives what you're doing significance. Just copying somebody doesn't give what you're doing any significance. You're copying someone. Okay, that's the Gemara in Megillah. That's the Maral according to the Pachad Yitzchak. We now go back to page 118 in Yeshaya. And we're up to Pasuk Chof Gimel. Yeshaya continues the prophecy over Bovel. V'samtiha lemorash kipod v'agme Page 119, the translation. I will make it an inheritance for the hedgehog and marshes of water. In other words, Bovel is going to turn into a desolate land. There'll be a place for hedgehogs to live and marshes of water. Page 120, 
Vitei te siha pamata. You go into the hardware store and you want to buy a broom. What do you ask for? A matata. And this is where the word is. Vitei te siha bimaate ashme neumashem sabakos. 121, the English. And I will sweep Bavel clean with the broom of destruction, the word of Hashem. Okay. Pasik Chaftalid, Nishba Hashem Tzavaka Yislamar, prophecy of Yeshaya, God swears, Imlo Kashe Dimisi Kain Hayasa, Rachashe Yoatsi Hisaku. Psukim 24 through 27. Now change a bit the subject. The subject now is, <clears throat> excuse me, the prophecy again of the fall of Assyria. Ashur ruled the world, basically. Ashur, the king of Ashur, came and exiled the ten tribes from the northern kingdom. Then the Babylonians came and conquered the Assyrians. Eventually, the Babylonians will be destroy, destroyed by the Medes and the Persians. So now, while Yeshai is prophesizing about the downfall of Bovel, he's going to insert certain sukkim here about the fall of Assyria. The fall of Assyria is before Bovel. In fact, the fall of Assyria is in the hands of Bovel. So in this prophecy about Bovel, <clears throat> Yeshaya addresses Assyria, Ashur, as a warning sign to Bavel. Okay, page 120, Pasuk 24. Nishba Hashem dimisi kein hayasa, hisoko. Next Pasuk, we'll come back to the English in a moment. Lishbar Ashur ba'artsi valharai avusena. Next passage, 26. Passage Hashem, Master of Legions, has sworn, saying, Surely as I have conceived, so shall happen. When God makes a plan, it's going to happen. This is dealing now with Ashur, the Assyrians. And as I have devised, so will be established. It's my plan, God says. To break Assyria in my land, the Assyrians had conquered the northern kingdom and they were in, they were ruling the northern part of Eretz Israel. I will trample them on my mountains. They will be destroyed on my mountain. Remember, we learned at the end of in, in Malachim Beis that uh, Sanchev of Melech Ashur came down to Yerushalayim when Chizkiyo, the tzaddik, the king, was the king of the southern kingdom, a scion of the Davidic dynasty. And he saw the city of Yerushalayim and he wanted to conquer it. Sanchev stargazers told him that your only chance, the stars tell us, your only chance to conquer Yerushalayim is if you do it today. You won't be able to do it tomorrow. He marched towards Yerushalayim. He looked out at Yerushalayim. He saw a walled city. It was a very small city. And he said to his troops, why do I need to bother myself and bother my whole army? to go attack that little city. We've had a very busy day fighting, a very busy day conquering, a very busy day marching. We're gonna to go to sleep, wake up tomorrow morning, the stargazers don't know what they're talking about. We'll conquer Yerushalayim tomorrow morning. Well, how much effort is it gonna take? It's a tiny little city. And so he went to sleep and his army went to sleep and that was the night of Pesach. One of the many miracles that happened the night of Pesach. And by the time the morning came, 180,000 Assyrian troops had died in their sleep. The Chazal tell us that the Rebona Shalom opened their ears. While the Assyrian army was sleeping, the Rebona Shalom opened their ears so they would be able to hear 
the songs, the shir that the malachim sing during the night. And when a human being hears that shir, he sort of, the ruchnis of the shir implode, it caused him to implode. So all 180,000 troops were killed in their sleep. Sancheira woke up the next morning to find that he had no army. He ran away and eventually he is assassinated. So the prophecy here is to break Assyria in my land, I will trample him on my mountains. The Assyrians will die on the mountains surrounding Yerushalayim. His yoke will be removed from upon Israel and his burden will, re will be removed from upon Israel's shoulder. This is the plan that is devised against all the land, and this is the land that is outstretched against all the nations. For Hashem, master of legions, has devised that who can annul, his hand is outstretched, and who can turn it back. Now, what is the purpose of inserting the prophecy of the downfall of Assyria into the prophecy of the downfall of Babel? The Assyrian downfall will happen first and then the Assyrians will fall to the Babylonians. So we're in the middle of talking about the Babylonians and their downfall, which just by chronological order means that the Assyrians have fallen. If we're already talking about Bavel ruling the world and the fall of Bavel, well, that means that Bavel conquered Assyria many years before. So why are we inserting here out of chronological order the fall of Bavel? So Rashi tells us, if you take a look in the art scroll on page 121, verses 24 through 27, this prophecy foretells the destruction of the Assyrian army that took place just outside the walls of Yerushalayim. Rashi connects it to the previous prophecy about the destruction of Bavel. God is warning that the Nebuchadnezzar, that when he, when he sees the divine word come true against Ashur, he will realize that the prophecy concerning Babel will come about as well. Inserted into the downfall of Babel is a warning to the Nebuchadnezzar. The Nebuchadnezzar, you should remember that there was a prophecy about the fall of the Assyrian kingdom. And that prophecy came true. And how do you know, Nebuchadnezzar, that that prophecy came true? Because you yourself, Nebuchadnezzar, conquered the Assyrian kingdom. So you know when my Nevi'im, God says, Nebuchadnezzar, you know when God's Nevi'im prophesies about the fall of a nation, it will happen. And you are the first witness of that case because you conquered Assyria based upon prophecies of the Nevi'im. So you too, Nebuchadnezzar, you should know that there are prophecies about the fall of Bovel for reasons that we talked about uh, in several shiurim. The Ramban talks about in Pashas Lepecha. The Babylonian Empire crumbled, even though God put them in charge of conquering Eretz Yisrael and conquering Yerushalayim and destroying the base Hamikdash for two reasons. First, they went beyond their bounds. They, instead of just conquering Eretz Yisrael and conquering Yerushalayim, they oppressed and tortured and maimed and raped. And for that, they were punished and destroyed. And the second reason is even the fact that they, what they did, had they remained inside the proper bounds of what they were supposed to do in the name of God, they didn't do it in the name of God. Nebuchadnezzar patted himself on the back and considered his victory over Yerushalayim to be the result of a great army, the result of his strategy, his great tactical warfare, and he didn't understand that he was nothing more than an agent of the Rebbe Shlomo. So Bovel fell too. So the Rebbe Shlomo is warning Nebuchadnezzar, when I, when I send a prophet to tell about the fall of a kingdom, it happens. It happened to Assyria. And happened to Assyria because you conquered Assyria, so then you know the words of Nevi Matru. And Yeshaya is now prophesizing about you, Nebuchadnezzar, that you too shall fall at the appropriate time because of your conduct. So that is, uh, we're up to now, Pasik, what page 120? We're up to Pasik. 28, Chaches. 
And this is uh, a new Navua. It's a Navua of Yeshaya about Eretz Palishtim, the land of the Philistine, not to be construed with Palestine. There was a nation called Palishtim, has nothing to do with Palestinians. They are the Philistines. And now Yeshaya turns his prophecy to Pleshes, to the Philistines. Yishnas Mos HaMelech Achos Hoya Hamasa Hazeh. In the year that Achos HaMelech died, the following prophecy took place. Achos was a sign of the Davidic dynasty, as you recall. He was the father of Hiskiyahu. Hiskiyahu, the great tzaddik, who had the neshama of Mashiach in him, but was not allowed to reveal himself as Mashiach, as we learned about. And Achaz was Hiskiyahu's father. Achaz was a terrible Russian. In the year that Achaz died, the following prophecy was said by Yeshaya. al tismachi Phileshes, Kulech ki nishpa shevet maker ki mishoresh nochash yeitzei tsefa upirioi sorof meofeif. The history here is there was a Jewish king of the Davidic dynasty, Uziah. Uziah, King Uziah, was a tzaddik. Unfortunately, we learned uh, that he got it saras for for the reasons we learned about. We learned about it in Sefer Malachim. We learned about it earlier in Sefer Yeshai. But he was a tzaddik. But he got it saras. He succeeded in conquering Pelishtim. And he put the Pelishtim in their place so they would stop attacking the Jewish people. In the days of Ahaz, the Pelishtim came back and attacked from the south and took over parts of Eretz Yisrael in the south. And they were rejoicing over the fact that they had conquered certain parts of Eretz Yisrael in the south. And this was in the year, in the years that Ochaz the Russia uh, ruled Eretz Yisrael, was the king in the south. So Yo, uh, Uziyahu was Ochaz's grandfather, Uziyahu Yosom Ochaz Chizkiyo. If you open your first posseg in Yeshaya, go back to the very beginning of the book, you have those four kings. Uziah was a tzaddik. He got a tzaraz. Yosem was a son. Tremendous, tremendous tzaddik. We learned about him. The Gemara talks about him in Sech the Sukkah as an unbelievable tzaddik who in conjunction with Reb uh, Shem Bayechoi and Reb Shem and son would be able to save the whole world. Yosem had a tremendous chus of kibbutz av, tzaddik. His son Achaz is the Russia we're talking about, and his son is Chizkiyo, the great tzaddik. So in the days of Uziah, Uziah conquered Pleshes. He got he got the he conquered the Philistines. His grandson Achaz was defeated by the Philistines. And now there's a prophecy about the fall of the Philistines. The Philistines. Altismachi Pleshes, Posik 29, Kuler, Ki Nishpa Shevet Maker, Ki Mishoyresh Nacha Shetze Tsefa, Upirio Sorof Ma'ofa. Page 121. In the year of King Achaz's death, this prophecy came. Do not rejoice, O Philistia, all of you because the staff that beat you has been broken, for from the root of the snake will emerge a viper, and its progeny will be a flying serpent. This is a, a nevoa about Chizkiyahu. Even though you've defeated Achas, and you Philistines have taken part of southern Eret Yisrael, a new king is arising. Achas has died. And a new king, his son, Chizkiyo, is going to take over, and he is going to conquer you once and for all. There will be a, and from the progeny of Achaz, will there be a flying serpent, in other words, a mighty warrior, Chizkiyo, who will come and defeat you. Pasek Lamed on page 120, V'ro'u b'chorei dalim ve'evyonim lo'vetak, 
Lavetach Yubatsu, page 122. Vehemati Varov Shoshech Ush Eriseh Yaharov. Back to page 121. The foremost of the poor will then graze and the destitute will lie down in security. In other words, the Jewish people who were impoverished in the South by virtue of what the Pelishtim were doing, now that the Pelishtim will be conquered by Hizkiyahu, so the Jewish people will be able to once again, quote unquote, graze, they'll be able to live peacefully, and they will be able to lie down in security. And, and addressing the Pelishtim themselves, and I will kill your root with famine. In other words, the Rosh Hashanah is now saying, I'm going to get to the root of the Pelishtim problem. We're not talking about Palestinians. We're talking about the Pelishtim, the nation Pelishtim. I'm going to kill your root finally with a famine, and he will slay your remnant. Page 122, Pasuk Laman Aleph. Hey, Lili, Shah, Okay. Page 123, Pasuk 31. Wail for the gate, cry out for the city, melt in fear, O Philistia, all of you. For smoke comes from the north. This is again a metaphor for Chizkiyahu. There's a great smoke coming from the north, and he is going to defeat you. And no one is isolated among his appointed troops. His army is going to come. He's going to destroy you. Now, when this happens, what will be reported is a very interesting last passage to this parrot. What will the messengers of the nation say? What will be the message after Yechezkiyo and his army defeats Colossus? What will be the headlines in the newspaper? That Hashem has established Zion. Hashem has again established Zion. The southern kingdom will be safe. Yerushalayim will be safe. The Beis Hamikdash will be safe under Chizkiyo. And in it, the poor of his people will take shelter. If you take a look at page 123 in the Yard Scroll, verse 32, the commentary, What will the, message of, the messengers of the nation say? What will the Israelite messengers announce as news during the days of Hiskiel? What will be the news? The media. The press reports, what will be the news after Chizkiyo comes along and wipes out the root of Pleshes, the Philistines, who for centuries gave the Jewish people problems in the south, all the way back through Yoshua, Shoftim, every so often the Polishtim would rise up and give the Jewish people down south all kinds of problems. And finally, we have a prophecy here from Yeshayo that this Yo has come and he's going to kill the root with a famine. So what will be the news finally? The news is going to be, as it says in Pasuk 32, Hashem has established Zion and in it the poor of his people take shelter. The key to the news is the word Hashem. This final conquering of the Philistines will be reported in the news as Hashem has established Zion. Hashem has, has created, has made the victory. In contradistinction to the Babylonians who took credit and they were destroyed, in contradistinction to the Assyrians who took credit because uh, they were destroyed because they took credit for what they had done instead of acting as the agents of Hashem, the news that will come out from Hiskiyo's conquering of the Philistines will be Hashem has established Zion. Credit where credit is due, everything was God's plan, and so long as we continue to focus on God's plan and that we are working towards God's plan, 
everything remains safe. The Beis Hamikdash remains safe. Yerushalayim remains safe. We start patting ourselves on the back and taking credit for our tactical ingenuity and our strategy and our defense. And these are all very important things, but ultimately we have to be able to say that yes, all of these things are important, the right army, the right weapons, but ultimately the right army and the right weapons needs God's blessing and it's from Hashem. So this is a, one, a wonderful, beautiful Pasuk. And finally, when the Jewish people rid themselves of this constant problem in the south, the Palishtim, what will the news say? Again, reading the Arts Grove. What will the Israelite messengers, in other words, those who witnessed the war, what will they announce as the news? And they will announce as the news that Hashem, Hashem has established Sion in the south. The north already has been exiled. Yushalayim is safe. Chizkiyo is safe. The Jewish army is safe. The people are safe because that's Hashem's plan. And that will be the news of the day. Okay, so we're up to Peret Tesvav in Yeshai, and you can see the first words on page 22, on page 122. Masa Moab, this is now going to be a prophecy about the nation of Moab.